Welcome to the seventh week of Analysis of a Complex Kind. This week we'll learn about Laurent's series and the residue theorem. Let's first start by remembering Taylor's series. Recall that if f is an analytic function in some open set u, you may have a whole. And suppose that f is analytic in this open set u. Suppose furthermore that we can find a disk somewhere that fits entirely into u, and that has a center uh, C0. In this scenario, F has a power series representation, a Taylor series, in this disk. And that representation is given by F of Z is the sum over coefficients AK times all these powers Z minus C0 to the K. And more is true, we can in fact compute these AKs, these coefficients AK right here, as the kth derivative of f at the center point c0 at the disk divided by k factorial. And that's how we found Taylor series for the exponential function and the sine function and the cosine function and lots of other functions. This is very useful because the power series of a function allows us to approximate values of the function easily computationally. Well, what if f is not differentiable in this entire disk? What if we have a situation where f is differentiable only in a portion of the disk. For example, the function z over z squared plus 4, where is that analytic? Well, z squared plus 4 is equal to z minus 2i times z plus 2i, and that is equal to 0 when z is plus or minus 2i. So this function is clearly not analytic at 2i or at negative 2i because at those two points we'd be dividing by zero. So what if I wanted a series representation in a neighborhood of 2i, however? What if I was really interested in values of the function close to this point 2i? So what if I wanted a series representation in this disk, and the function is not analytic in the center? That's what Laurent series are there to help us with. Another example of a function that's not differentiable everywhere is the logarithm function. Remember the principal branch of the logarithm is analytic in the entire complex plane with the exception of the negative real axis and the origin. So here there are many disks in which the function is analytic. So I can put this disk right here and I can find a Taylor series representation there or I can find a Taylor series in this disk but the function is not analytic on the negative real axis. So here I can't even find an annulus of the type I just showed you in the previous example that kind of surrounds places where the function is not analytic because I couldn't draw the whole annulus. It's going to be crossing through the portion where the function is not analytic. So here's the Laurent series theorem. Suppose f is analytic in an open set u. Maybe there's a hole here and some stuff missing there or maybe here. But as long as I can find an annulus that fits into u in which f is analytic, and that annulus is centered at some point c0, and that c0 may not be part of your domain. So this is the point c0, and I have this inner radius r, and the outer radius uppercase r, and all I need is that the space between these two boundary components is entirely contained in u. So inside I have stuff that's not contained in u, and on the outside I have stuff that's not contained in u, but between the two boundary components, the function is analytic everywhere. So in this situation, then in that annulus, in that blue region, f has a series representation. It looks a little bit different from a Taylor series. And here's the difference. Everything looks just like a Taylor series, but the one difference is that the summation starts at negative infinity and goes all the way to infinity. So we have a series that's infinite in both directions. It's called a doubly infinite series. So what that means is I sort of need dots indicating that this series goes arm and on on both ends of it. I have an a0 and then a1 z minus c0, a2 z minus c0 squared, just as in a Taylor series. But I also have negative exponents k here that I need to take into consideration. So when k is equal to negative 1, z minus c0 to the negative 1, that's 1 over z minus c0 that gives rise to this term right here. And then there's an a minus 2 over z minus c0 squared term, and so forth. So this series could be 
doubly infinite in both directions, and we'll see a bunch of examples. So if I have a function that's analytic in an annulus, just like the blue region I drew below, then in that annulus the function has a series representation, that's called the Aileron series for the function. And not only is the series convergent in that annulus, but if I in fact make my annulus a little bit smaller, and so those two radii are now called S and T, so the smaller radius is S, and the larger one is T. So in this situation, where I stayed away from the boundary, in that new region that's a little bit smaller than the original annulus, in that new region, that subannulus, the convergence is in fact absolute and uniform. We won't be using those terms a lot, so if you don't really remember what those means, that's quite all right. But for those of you who are interested, uh, this is very similar to the theorem on Taylor series that we had, in which we had locally uniform convergence in the entire disk in which the function was analytic, and as soon as we stayed away from the boundary, the convergence was absolute and uniform. Note also that the coefficients a, k are again uniquely determined by the function. A function in a given annulus has exactly one Laurent series expansion. So how do we find these coefficients a, k? Let's start by looking at an example. Suppose we're looking at the function f of z is 1 over z minus 1 times z minus 2. So where is that function analytic? Well, it's analytic everywhere except when I'm dividing by 0. And I'm dividing by 0 when z is equal to 1 or when z is equal to 2. So the function is analytic everywhere except at 1 and 2. Now I need to find an annulus that fits into the domain where the function actually is analytic. So for example, I could choose the annulus z between 1 and 2 in absolute value. So this is centered at the origin, and between these two boundary components, indeed, my function is analytic because as long as I stay between those two boundary components and I'm not on the boundary itself, then I'm never dividing by 0 because z never has the value 1 or 2. And therefore, I know it must have a Laurent series expansion. The question is, how do I find it? So let me show you a trick for finding the Laurent series expansion. The trick is to do a partial fraction decomposition first. And we don't have to make it that complicated. So instead of actually doing a real partial fraction decomposition, I'll show you a little shortcut. We replace this one in a smart way by z minus 1 minus z minus 2. I chose those so that I could then pull the fraction apart, make it into two fractions, and cancel out parts of the denominator in each step. So 1 is the same thing as z minus 1 minus z minus 2, because this z cancels out with this z, and I have left minus 1 minus minus 2, which is 2 minus 1, which is really 1. When I pull this fraction apart, I find myself with z minus 1 over z minus 1, z minus 2, and in that fraction, the z minus 1 cancels out. And I'm left with 1 over z minus 2. For the second fraction, I have z minus 2 divided by z minus 1, z minus 2, and in that fraction, the z minus 2 cancels out. And I'm left with 1 over z minus 1. So altogether, 1 over z minus 1 times z minus 2 is the same thing as 1 over z minus 2 minus 1 over z minus 1. I want to make use of the geometric series. Let me remind you that the sum n from 0 to infinity of q to the n is equal to 1 over 1 minus q as long as the absolute value of q is less than 1. So how do we use that for 1 over z minus 2? What is less than 1 here? So it has a little bit the look of the 1 over 1 minus q, but not quite. We need to get our hands on something that is less than 1 here. Well, we know that z in absolute value is bigger than 1 and less than 2. So how can I rewrite that so I get terms that are less than 1? Because z is greater than 1, I get that 1 over the absolute value of z is less than 1. So if I can get 1 over the absolute value of z in there, then I'm good. I also know that z is less than 2 in absolute value, which means that z over 2 is less than 1. So these two facts are going to be crucial for us. So let's get back to 1 over z minus 2. 
if I factor out a 2, like I did right here, if I factor out a 2 from the denominator, then my fraction becomes 1 over z over 2 minus 1. And that's exactly in the form 1 over 1 minus q, except the terms are reversed. So I'm going to factor out negative 1 in addition, and I'm left with 1 over 1 minus z over 2. Since z over 2 is less than 1, as we showed right here, I can now rewrite the 1 over 1 minus z over 2 as a geometric series, where my q is equal to z over 2. So this first part here becomes minus 1 half times the sum z over 2 to the k. We still need to look at the second part, namely the 1 over z times 1 minus 1 over z. That came from 1 over z minus 1, and I factored out a z. And the factoring out of the z gave me this 1 minus 1 over z term in the denominator, and we know that 1 over z is less than 1. So we're going to again use the geometric series idea. This z right here stays on the outside. And the 1 over 1 minus 1 over z becomes the geometric series, the sum k from 0 to infinity, 1 over z to the k. Now that I have all that, my last goal is to write this so I really recognize it as a Laurent series. The first thing I want to do is I want to bring this factor in front of the series into the series. So that means this 2 adds another 2 to the denominator, so the denominator becomes 2 to the k plus 1. The minus 1 comes inside right here, and the z to the k is still there. And for the second series, I want to bring the minus 1 over z into the series. So I get the negative 1 right here, and the denominator becomes z to the k plus 1. Well, I only wrote z to the k here, and the reason for that is that I've simply started counting at k equals 1. Since the series goes to infinity, the powers of z that I would be looking at in the series, minus 1 over z to the k plus 1, when k runs from 0 to infinity, the exponents k plus 1 run from 1 through infinity. And so instead of saying k goes from 0 to infinity and using the exponent k plus 1, I can simply say k goes from 1 to infinity and I use the exponent k. And my last step is to write this second series in terms of negative powers of k because that's really how the wrong series are written. So instead of calling this 1 over z to the k, I recognize that that is equal to z to the negative k. And so instead of k going from 1 to infinity, I'm going to have k go from negative 1 to negative infinity because all these powers here are negative. And instead I can just write z to the k, but I use negative indices for my series. This is what we just showed. I can now read off the coefficients of this Laurent series. The first sum captures all of the positive powers of z. So for example, a0, which is the coefficient of z to the 0, so I, that's what I get when k is equal to 0, is simply minus 1 over 2 to the 0 plus 1, so 2. a1, which is the coefficient I get when k is equal to 1, is minus 1 over 2 squared, which is 4, and so forth. But I also have negative powers of z, and those I find in the second sum here. So I find a negative 1, which is the coefficient that I get when k is equal to negative 1, is simply 2 minus 1. a negative 2 is equal to minus 1, and so forth. So all the negative coefficients are simply negative 1, and all the positive coefficients are negative 1 over the power of 2. Here again is the picture of where the function is analytic. It's analytic everywhere except at the points 1 and 2. And so in the first example, we chose an annulus that ran between those two points 1 and 2. What if I chose a different annulus? We notice that f is also analytic in z's that are bigger than 2 in absolute values. So I could simply look at this annulus, and the outside component is unbounded. That's also considered an annulus f is analytic in that annulus as well. So in that annulus, f must have a Laurent series expansion as well. Let's find it. 
trick is again the same as before. I do my partial fraction decomposition. So 1 over z minus 1, z minus 2 is 1 over z minus 2 minus 1 over z minus 1. But this time I simply need to factor a little bit differently. We want to use the same geometric series factor. So what can we conclude from this condition? From this condition, we can conclude only that 2 over z is less than 1. So that's a fact we can use here. The infinity part doesn't really help us all that much. But in addition, because 2 over z is less than 1, if I look at 1 over z, which is half of 2 over z, that's clearly also less than 1 in absolute value. So those are the two facts we're going to use now in this region that we're looking at. So the idea is that 1 over z minus 2, I'm going to factor out a z, and I'm left with 1 minus 2 over z inside the parentheses, and 2 over z is less than 1 in absolute value. And so I already have a perfect term here for a geometric series expansion. And for the second term, I do the same thing. I factor out a z, and I'm left with 1 minus 1 over z in parentheses. And again, 1 over z is less than 1 in absolute value, so again, I can simply use my geometric series for that term as well. The first term, I have a 1 over z factored out, and then my q is 2 over z, so I have the sum 2 over z to the k. And for the second term, I have a 1 over z on the outside, and then my q is 1 over z, so the sum of 1 over z to the k. So it looks like I only have negative powers of z all over the place. So again, my goal is to write this so I recognize exactly what the negative powers of z are. So the first step is to bring this 1 over z and this 1 over z inside of the sums. If I do that, then in the first sum, my terms are going to be 2 to the k over z to the k plus 1, because I get an extra z and the sum goes from 0 to infinity. But I'm concerned mostly with the powers of z. What are those? So the powers of z in the denominator start at 1. Even though k equals 0 is the first k up plug and the powers really start at 1. So if I want to write this in powers of z, then I want to have k run from 1 to infinity and have a z to the k in the denominator. How is the numerator related to that? Well, the power of 2 in the numerator is just 1 less than the power of the denominator, so with my new summation index, I need to call the numerator 2 to the k minus 1. And then I do the same thing with the second sum. When I pull the z to the inside, my terms become 1 over z to the k plus 1. And I'm going to sum over those, k from 0 to infinity. But at, at a closer look, I notice that the exponents for z run from 1 through infinity. So I'm going to run my series from 1 through infinity. The numerator isn't even affected by that, so 1 over z to the k. And again, my last step involves making a 1 over z to the k into a z to the minus k, and then having the summation index run from negative infinity to negative 1 instead of from 1 to infinity, so I can replace a negative k with a k. So now I have a z to the k right here. So this is no longer in the denominator, and my summation index takes care of the negative values. And my numerator, what used to be 2 to the k minus 1 minus 1, becomes 2 to the minus k minus 1 minus 1 because I replaced k with minus k. All right, so we have seen that 1 over z minus 1 times z minus 2 has a Laurent series in the annulus where z is between 1 and 2 in absolute value, but has also another Laurent series expansion where z is greater than 2 in absolute value, and those are quite different from each other. What are the coefficients a k in this last example? We notice that k only takes negative values, so a0 isn't even there. a0 is equal to 0, and so is a1 and so is a2, and so forth. All the non-negative powers of z are there, and so all those corresponding coefficients are all equal to 0. What's a negative 1? A negative 1 is the coefficient that I get when k is equal to negative 1 right here. And when k is equal to negative 1, I find 2 to the negative negative 1 minus 1, and then minus 1. So that is 2 to the 0 minus 1, so 1 minus 1. That's actually also equal to 0. What's a minus 2? 
a minus 2 is 2 to the negative, negative 2, minus 1, minus 1. So 2 to the 2 minus 1, that's 2, minus 1, so that's 1. a negative 3 is 2 to the negative, negative 3, minus 1, minus 1. So 2 squared, minus 1, so that's 3, and so forth. Those are very different from our first example. But those are, again, not the only amuli I could choose. Again, here's my picture. The function is analytic everywhere, except I need to avoid the points 1 and 2. And so far, I chose amuli that are centered at 0, but I don't have to do that. I could also choose an annulus that's centered elsewhere. F is also analytic, and an annulus centered at 1. And what radius can I choose there? I can choose a radius up to 1. I can't go any bigger because then I would hit this discontinuity at 2. The annulus, whose inside radius is actually 0, and the outside radius is 1. In that annulus, f is also analytic. It's not analytic at 1 itself, so I need to make sure that I have a strict inequality here. But as long as I keep that strict inequality, f is analytic in this annulus, whose inside component is really, really small. So it must have a Laurent series there as well. Again, my tricks are exactly the same as before. Z minus 1 is less than 1, so I'm going to use that fact that Z minus 1 is less than 1 and try to find a geometric series expansion using that fact. So how do I write 1 over Z minus 2 using that Z minus 1 is less than 1? Well, I'm going to write that as 1 over Z minus 1 minus 1. And the only thing I need to do is now flip the order of these two terms so it looks like a geometric series, so I get an extra negative sign from flipping, and I have 1 over 1 minus z minus 1. So the q in my geometric series is z minus 1, and I find this is equal to negative sign times the sum k equals 0 to infinity, z minus 1 to the k, just a geometric series. And this is true for z minus 1, an absolute value between 0 and 1. And so my function itself, which is 1 over z minus 2 minus 1 over z minus 1, the 1 over z minus 2 I replace with my geometric series. And then all I have left is 1 over z minus 1, which already looks like a term of a Laurent series, so I don't have to do anything with it. And the last thing I want to do is combine these two into one series. And it turns out 1 over z minus 1 that is actually the same thing as z minus 1 to the negative 1. And that's exactly the same form as the terms in the sum up front. And so I can pull this last term into the sum, have the sum starting at negative 1 instead of at 0, so I take into consideration this new term as well. I have a negative sign in front of the new term as well as in front of the sum, so I have a negative 1 there altogether. And this is my Laurent series in the annulus where z minus 1 is between 0 and 1 in absolute value. And so in this annulus, all the ak's are equal to negative 1. Well, not all the ak's, but this is true for k from negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and so forth. The other ones are equal to 0. So ak is equal to 0 for k less than or equal to negative 2. Here's another example. The function sine z over z to the fourth is really analytic in the entire complex plane unless I'm dividing by 0, which happens when z is equal to 0. So it's analytic in the complex plane minus the origin. I can find a Laurent series in an annulus that's arbitrarily large on the outside components. I might as well call that infinity, but I can't draw that and the inside component has radius 0. So how do I find the Laurent series centered at 0? Well, remember, for sine z itself, so if the denominator wasn't there, we would have a Taylor series expansion. And that is given by z minus z cubed over 3 factorial plus z to the fifth over 5 factorial, and so forth. And here's just the summation and notation for that. So if I want to look at sine z over z to the fourth, I need to just divide each of those terms by z to the fourth z divided by z to the fourth is 1 over z cubed. z cubed over 3 factorial, if I divide that by z to the fourth, I get a 1 over z term times 1 over 3 factorial. z to the fifth 
over 5 factorial, if I divide that by z to the 4th, I'm left with a z times 1 over 5 factorial, and so forth. So again, I can read off my coefficients. There's a 1 over z cubed term right here, and this 1 over z cubed term belongs to a minus 3. So I get a minus 3 is equal to 1. Then the 1 over z term right here, that belongs to a minus 1. So a minus 1 is actually negative 1 over 3 factorial. And there's no 1 over z squared term, so a minus 2 must be 0. Similarly, there's no constant term, so a 0 is equal to 0. And then I come to the positive powers of z. So right here, I have a power of 1, so 1 over 5 factorial must be my a1. There's no z squared term, so a2 is 0. a3 is negative 1 over 7 factorial, and so forth. So far, we have found all of the coefficients a k by actually computing the Laurent series. Remember that for Taylor series, so where a function was actually analytic in an entire disk, we found that the a k's in the Taylor series expansion can be computed as the k derivative of f at that center point c0 divided by k factorial. Wouldn't it be nice if for Laurent series we had a similar formula? So how about these Laurent series, where my function is now analytic only in an annulus centered at some point c0? Well, f may not even be defined at c0 because all we're saying is that f is analytic in the annular region, but we know nothing about f at c0. And so we can't really even speak of the k derivative of f at c0. So we need some new approach here. Remember Taylor series for a second. We know that a k is the kth derivative of f at c0 divided by k factorial. That's what we had up here. By Cauchy's theorem, the kth derivative of f at c0 can be found by k factorial over 2 pi i times the integral of f divided by z minus c0 to the k plus 1. Then we're integrating over some radius s for any s less than r. One can show a similar fact for Laurent series. Here's the theorem. If f is analytic in an annulus, and the inside radius is little r, and the outside radius is uppercase r, and it's centered at this point c0, at which we know nothing, so f is analytic in this annulus, but that's all we know. Then we know f has a Laurent series expansion by our first theorem, but we know actually more. The a case can be computed as 1 over 2 pi i times the integral over a curve inside the annulus, the distance s from the center point c0, of f of z divided by z minus c0 to the k plus 1. And this is true for any curve of radius s that's between the two green curves. Now this still doesn't seem all that useful for finding actual values of ak because we'd have to solve all these integrals and that sounds really hard, but it's useful to actually estimate these ak's. So sometimes we just need to know that certain ak's uh, are very small or very large or have certain values. And we'll use it later in exactly that way. In the next lecture we'll learn about isolated singularities of analytic functions.